All right, guys, welcome to another episode of Real McCoy Radio. This next guest came all the way from Canada just for the show. Just for the show, man. man what That's a I like, great dude. guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long way to travel for a podcast. A few thousand miles, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we're joking. Um, uh, but Matthew and I have got to spend... Uh, this is Matthew Park, by the way. How's it going, guys? Yeah. Um, we've got to spend the last about four days together. Yep. Um, you had your mastermind group. Tell yep. us a little bit about what we've been doing these past few days. Well, first we had the discovery at your world famous hidden gym and literally it's hidden. Yeah. And it's a great, great gym. When you walk in, you're like, where is this gym? Yeah. You know, and we had discovery at your gym first. Obviously it turned into a mastermind for two days at uh, the local place by your gym. And we had trainers from all over Canada and the U S that came on from uh, learning about their business. Some were active clients that wanted to keep scaling their businesses. We held that and now we're here. Yeah, yeah, it's been super fun. I attended all of it. Um, the discovery day was cool. It was like a great teaser, but still learned a lot. And then the mastermind was just a great experience. I mean, um, all of the content that you gave was so great. And I'm like so pumped to like start applying it to my business. Um, but I think the what really set it in was being with people on different stages of their journey. You know, the fact that I'm seeing someone that's maybe uh, just getting started um, all the way to people that are earning incredible figures. I mean, you have a 20K a month club, a 30K a month club. I mean, these are trainers that are making some crazy, uh, crazy numbers in their business. So it's yes, been awesome. Totally. Uh, but the experience was great and it was fun to meet everybody. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing the relationship with you and with the people that I was able to meet. We're going to keep growing together, man. It's going to yeah. be awesome. I can't And wait. we got a shout yeah. out um, Todd Abrams. Oh, man. Big Todd over there. Yeah. You know, he's so tall and lean and ripped. <laughs> He is super you know, ripped. You know, he walks in the room and he like towers over all of us. <laughs> yeah. So shout out to Todd who owns Icon Meals, um, introduced us. And, um, you know, we have a passion at Hidden Gym for hosting educational opportunities, whether that be for the members or for, you know, our trainers and people that yeah. do business there. Totally. So it was a perfect fit and I've been uh, thrilled at how it's gone. The best meals in all the U.S., man, as far as prepared food. Icon meals, the cookie I if I took about 30 more bags of chips like, from me back yeah, home. Yeah, I like the, the chips. Man, yeah, the yeah, nacho the chips are amazing. <laughs> okay, so let's um, let's crank this off. Um, you have obviously a ton of value to provide, um, especially the, I think you fit perfectly into uh, who my listeners are. Um, a lot of trainers, gym owners, fitness entrepreneurs listen to this. But let's start out. Um, you told us a story. Um, you came from modest beginnings in the fitness world. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. And you kind of came from a very modest place to now coaching trainers. You know, you yourself were a 20 K trainer. Um, and now you're coaching trainers that are in the 10, 20 and $30,000 a month, uh, earning Range. bracket. Yeah. Yeah. My story is probably one of the oddest ball stories you're ever going to hear. <laughs> um, I'm from Canada as you probably can tell with the A. And uh, I'm from uh, Alberta, a place called Alberta in Canada, but a very small town uh, and farm called Acadia Valley. If you look on the map, you won't even find it on the map. The population of, of Acadia Valley is 100 people. When I lived there, it was about 98. Okay, so maybe one more family would have moved in in the last you know, 15, <laughs> 20 years. But uh, I grew up on that town, um, and that small town, in fact, our grocery store was probably the size of this facility right here. You walk in with like two little aisles. And um, ever since I was 12 years old, like I was, I was the bully kid in school. I was the picked on kid in school. Uh, I never lifted away till I was 12. And then I wanted to use it as a means to build me some confidence in school. When I was about 18, I, uh, I'm a risk taker. So I wanted to actually move and, and make, a, make a bold move from a small town to California. And uh, before I left, well, before I actually had, had emailed this guy, who owned a gym in, in California called King's Fitness Gym. And the owner actually was Cameron King, who's a phenomenal guy. And um, But when I emailed the guy, told me, yeah, I'm, actually, I'm a Canadian guy. I'm looking for a potential position for a personal trainer in your gym. Is there a spot available? He says, yeah, there is a spot. Um, when you come, I'm coming next month. Um, I'll see you at this day at this time. So that was a month before. Um, a month later, obviously, I fly down. And I walk in the gym at 5 o'clock in the morning when it opened. And I walk in the gym. Of course, I'm a Canadian walking down the street in Glendora, California. It's pitch dark. I'm the short guy, maybe 140 pounds, 50 pounds soaking wet. I walk into this tall, like six foot five, 280 pound, like boulder of a man on the bench press. And I'm like, oh my, I'm looking up like this. I'm like, hello, sir. I'm looking for Cameron King. And he says, yeah, um, why are you asking? Uh, well, I'm a Cadian guy that I'm looking for Cam you know, Cameron. Well, I'm, I'm actually Cameron King. Uh, who are you again? <laughs> I'm the guy from Canada that emailed you a month ago. And he's like, Cadian guy from a month ago. I'm like, Tell me that again. I'm going to email you about personal training. 
oh, you're that guy. I didn't think you actually were going to show up. <laughs> and uh, and he's like, okay, give me an hour and we'll talk after the workout. And an hour later, we sat down. He's like, you know, here's here's what I'll do. Like, obviously, you're from Canada. You're here illegally. And, <laughs> and uh, I'll give you one client to try at $25 an hour and we'll see where it goes. And uh, I, I've got this guy named Walter. Uh, I trained him for a couple of days. He saw how much I was engaging with Walter. He's like, you know, I'll give you a couple more clients. By the end of the week, I had like three or four clients. And then uh, all of a sudden, um, he's like, in a week, he's like, hey, uh, like people are talking about you in this gym. and But they're a little concerned. And I'm like, what are they concerned about? He's like, well, he's like, I had a member's company. He said, he said, is this guy kind of like, he, you know, is he, he's not from here, right? I said, no. Is, is he like smoking something or is he on some drugs? And I'm like, I don't think so. And I says, Matt, uh, they're, they're asking because you smile all the time. And he's like, is that normal? <laughs> and I said, well, that's how I am. And then a week after that, I was, I would, they were calling me the Walmart greeter. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then I got this job offer a week after that, like a week after I got there about, you know, managing the gym and I just turned that down and went to just personal training. But that was kind of my, my U S story getting kind of things going. And after nine months of being in the U S I had to move back to Canada because I couldn't get the green card sure. or the visa. So I came back and I ended up, uh, was going to go into massage therapy and that was a bad mistake. Um, I ended up finding this program called uh, Personal Trainer Diploma Program. It was a two-year diploma program, um, full-time study at Nate mm -hmm, Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I was uh, just turning to 19 at the time, and I jumped into this program. But here's the crazy story is they were already full. So when I called them in June, um, I was like, is there any way I can get in here? Like, I'll even pay you more money. I'm not sure what's going to go. I didn't have any money, but sure. I just had to put that out there anyway. Yeah. And uh, no, sir, there's no room. And I'm like, I, just, I, just, I was like, okay, there's got to be a way to get in this program. And all of a sudden, a day later, I got this call from this John Reeves guy. He's like, Unfor unfortunately, so this has never happened before in the history of our program. We actually have an opening happen as of this morning. And I was like, Out of, this has been around for 10 years, this program has yeah. happened. I got in this program. I was in there for two years. So I was 21 years old. Then I was kind of like doing clients, one here, one there, off and on. I was working part-time job kind of here and there, averaging maybe three to 500 bucks a month in personal training. And when I finished my school, I jumped right into full-time personal training, but full time for me was like three to four clients a week. Yeah, you know, making yeah. five hundred bucks a month. Yeah, and I was just the most I ever made was probably a thousand bucks a month in okay. that two year period. Okay, and I was bouncing around. I was like, I, I was I was struggling. I was living on my loan still and driving my my old farm truck that's worth five hundred bucks. Couldn't pay groceries, living on credit cards, and literally almost broke again. And I was like, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So um, of course I read the books, learned the processes, and tried to like get my sales going. And it took me about, um, that was two years. And then by the time I turned 25, um, four years in that process, I was earning 20K a month. And I went from, you know, being the $500, $500, $500 a month trainer to the $20,000 a month trainer. But that was, there was, that was great. But the problem was um, I was working all the time. Sure. And I was working to the point where I was feeling pretty burnt out. And that was also a serious problem. And so that was kind of my end of my kind of whole journey of going from the farm of 100 people to Edmonton, Alberta, and, and do my training in there. That's, um, you know, I think when, where trainers run into that wall, that's a really hard place to get around. And then there was no social media then, Greg. Yeah. So I was 13 years ago. So yeah. I was just doing it just ground floor and making it work, right? And yeah. the most trainers would make around me were between probably three to 5,000 a month. So uh, that takes me to my next question, which, um, you know, obviously how you take a trainer nowadays from say 2000 a month to 20,000 a month, a 10 times revenue jump. Yep. Um, how you do that's proprietary to some degree, but, um, in a rough outline, like where do you even start mm -hmm. to turn around someone's business to that proportion? First, they have to want to make a change. Like it, it, whenever you have to go from 2000, 20,000 a month, even two to 10, um, first, they have to be want to you know want to make the change and want to be coachable because I can say here's a formula, but if you don't want to make the changes, it's not going to work. Sure. So I'm like I have no magic pill, but I got a magic formula. Much like I think a lot of trainers can relate to that story. Yeah. You know, if, so if 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 you can be that trainer that doesn't want to make the changes, you know the frustration. Totally. <laughs> when you're trying to make those changes in your client. Totally. Hundred yeah. percent. It's really yeah. relatable, right? Yeah. As a coach. Yeah. So it's like, I think the biggest thing is, you know, as I talk about in our program, there's three things. And we talk about number one, getting things systemized in your business. So usually most trainers are working a state of their schedule, very disorganized, nothing is systemized, client files are everywhere or on their computers. And that's almost all of the trainers that we talk to. It's almost everybody. So it's like, 
Um, and it was also me for many, many years. So it's like getting things systemized, looking at how much you're earning each client, each session, and then working on charging your worth, right? And then the third piece is increasing revenue. Where trainers get mixed up is they focus on increasing revenue first and they work all this energy into it and then they get so disorganized and so burnt out that they just fall off the wagon because they can't handle it. Yeah. So it's like working from the other way and then keep going up. Yeah, I see that a lot. And um, I'm sure those of you listening could probably relate to this, but you know, one thing I'll see is a trainer rise really fast and then really struggle to deliver you know, they, you know, they maybe are good at sales or become, you know, a magnet to, to clients, but to be able to sustain that, you know, you need to be very organized. Yeah. Um, and that's usually not everyone's strong suit, at least, you know, just, just from the, you know, the many trainers that have uh, worked for me over the years, um, you know, organization is usually not towards the top of the list. 100% man. And even you've worked with a lot of trainers before in the past, like yeah, Lots no, of training, you know, man. owning gyms for, you know, now a little over 10 years, wow. we've had a lot of trainers through the doors. So, you know, you can start to uh, put them in buckets, uh, you know, kind of see different types of how, how everybody does. Totally, man. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So those are your, those are your kind of three prongs that you focus on. If you're going to really take somebody from where they are to that, that kind of earning potential. We can go deeper in each three, but I think the biggest one is, is, and also there's also the third piece. Going, I guess the second piece, charging your worth, is that I was talking to a client about, about this actually, the today actually on, on not, not not you, but somebody else about this, is that, you know, we can get we can have you increase your prices, mm -hmm. but if you don't congruently mentally align to what you feel your worth with on that prices, you're not going to sell anybody on it. Yeah. So there has to be a, um, an inner and an outer shift uh, congruently as you increase that process. And you know what the funny part is? A lot of trainers, I mean, I not more male than female, unfortunately. Um, they, all they want is the business. Just give me the business. Forget about the mental stuff. Yeah. I don't want that. <laughs> you know, that's just fluff stuff. Yeah. I'm like, that's fine. You'll get the business. You might increase for a month. You'll come back a month later and be all frustrated because you can't handle anything. Yeah. So it's like you want to have both. So you have concurrency in your, in your business model. And that's where it comes down to. Yeah. So you mean kind of like on the psychology of being able to sell a price that you're worth, you have to really make sure that you believe that. Yeah. And also, also that you believe that you're, um, that you, you want to congruently align to uh, feel success from within. Mm. So as you increase, you know, it's funny when I take trainers from like five or even like two or 3000 a month to 10, it's like, some don't even feel they're worth 10,000. They get mm. there and like, wow, I don't know. You didn't make that my corporate job. Like, it's like, that's incredible. Like, am I ever going to keep that? Is it going to go away? Is all of a sudden, is it going to, all my clients going to leave? So fear comes in. Mm. So, and all of a sudden 20 is a whole different scarcity level. mentality. Scarcity. Like I need to hoard this. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes we'll come and make 10 and then they'll fall back to five because they're like, oh my gosh, it's, it's like they sabotage. You get real it. careful. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sure. So yeah, specifically, because um, I, I know this for myself and then also talking to a lot of trainers and that's when it comes to increasing pricing. Um, why is that so difficult and how do you help them break that barrier? I think you kind of alluded to it a little bit already. Amazing question. Um, a lot of trainers, and it's, I think it comes because the industry has been so taught to always go by session-based fees. Mm -hmm. And here's why I charge per session or per pack, where now it's more on a value proposition or what am I going to get from this whole process of, of the package. And if we can go away from like what I'm going to charge you per session to what you're going to make on a package or a month or three months or a year and then deliver that package, you can earn two or three times more income in that process and deliver epic, or epic uh, value and work a lot less hours in that process. So, um, but trainers get stuck on, you know, how much per hour, but if we can just package it to get differently, you're going to be able to offer more and, and earn more at the same time too. Yeah. And I know too, like, um, you know, trainers I've worked with over the years to get, um, you know, build, build their business at a lower rate just to get, get somebody in there. Yeah. Um, and then they, they really struggle to make those price jumps, even if they're wor worth well more than what they're charging. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you coach people through that, through that process? And the, those clients that helped you get to where you are, even if that's not where you want to be, yeah. they, they did, you know, help you get there. How do you coach them through that process? Of, of you mean, uh, uh, increasing their pricing with existing clients mm. and, you know, you've got, um, a process for that. Yeah. Well, basically what we do is, is, uh, 
once once we define what the actual new package will be in the process is when they present that to that customer, it's always usually going to be a, usually a face to face or a phone call interaction, mm -hmm. and there's always going to be multiple options that that client can also partake in to make sure that you know if the client can't afford or isn't able to sustain the new pricing increase, we have option B, C, and D for you as well. But it also comes down to like just increasing pricing is just not enough. You have to obviously come and believe that. If you go in there and you're shaky, you're nervous, you're stuttering the prices out, you're like, they're probably not going to want to buy from you. Yeah, it's just sure. because you're not there yet. And there's also a problem if you go too high. Mm -hmm. If you go too high out of the range, then you could be ki you know, ki kicking yourself in the foot. So it's important to find that range where you feel two things. You feel uncomfortable, but also very excited. Mm. That's kind of the magic sauce. If you're like, well, it's, that's cool. That's a good range. Maybe it's, maybe it's a bit too low. But if you go too high and you're like, well, that's just totally unrealistic. Well, that's just a little bit silly. Yeah. Right. So. Because you almost can uh, judge, make pricing increases based on kind of the emotion that you get from the trainer. Totally. Like that. I don't think that would fly versus like, I, that's exciting, but I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of the, that scary, but excited range is what you look for. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, okay. So that's, that's pricing is one thing that, um, you know, I, a lot, a question I get a lot. So I wanted to cover, um, the next thing kind of comes to marketing, um, mm -hmm. which is my favorite part of the business. Um, when it comes to marketing for personal trainers, I feel like many trainers fall into the trap of, uh, marketing to everyone and in turn marketing to no one. Yeah. How do you help trainers, uh, go for a niche or do you recommend someone to, to be broad in their marketing? What's your take on that? No, well, most trainers, I would just say like, um, they, they think if they go, if they, if they pick a niche, they're going to miss out on, on clientele. So I usually say whenever you're starting out to get a 10 K work your database first. And we talked about the discovery day, but when you're building over 10 K, you really want to focus on that niche. And now by niche means, you don't, when you focus on a demographic, now, uh, go ahead. In Texas, at least we call it niche. Oh, <laughs> No, but this that's like funny, no, man. I've had this conversation with several Canadians, and you guys are niche. Niche, that's so cool. Yeah, eh? wow, <laughs> that's cool. Eh? You said niche, niche, niche. Yeah, niche. <laughs> that's the that's the the U.S. Canadian side going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all right, all right, so go on with the uh, niche. Where's my cowboy hat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got one for you. Okay, cool. Party gift. <laughs> um, yeah. So basically, with the, with the when you're knowing who you want to be serving. I always say, you know what, like I did in the mastermind, take your number one client you have right now, write down a piece of paper, and then basically just describe that right down to the A, B, C, and D of the pain points, the frustrations, the desires, the wants, everything. And that can be where you can start. And as you get better at that, you'll find out a demographic that really suits you. We talked about Kristen Graham with officers, right? And it took her three months to even believe that. But once she starts to get herself honed in her mental uh, state and honing to officers, there are probably millions of officers in the United States that could use their service, sure. right? And that's where we talk about niche. Like it could be, it could be lawyers, it could be you know real estateers, it could be financial advisors. What you're focusing on, and you know the industry is massive. And the funny thing is, you get paid more for niche. It's like a doctor. Are you a family doctor or a cardiologist, mm. right? So you go into a specialist, you know, and that's and even like when it comes to marketing. You know, are you a marketer or are you like uh, a digital marketing specialist, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna pay more for that. So it comes down to where you specialize in your niche. Yeah. So you really recommend to hone in and not be scared yeah. to hone in. And hone in. Because you can still take people. Oh, yeah. They're, and they're still going to come. Well, you know, a good example, you probably know Charles Poliquin or you, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, before he passed away. Sure. So he was, he's from our hometown, Montreal. Okay. And um, in fact, that's where he, like, that's where he got himself going was Montreal. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my clients were students. In fact, his best students. So um, Charles uh, was a mentor of ours and, and I knew Charles for a bit. And um, he was very, excuse my language, but he was very anal, like just very direct, mm -hmm. like no baloney, you know? Yep. And, um, but you know what he charged per hour? No. 1.5K for one hour of his time. <laughs> That's okay. insane, yeah. It's insane. But you know, he would talk about that. It's funny because his students, you know, um, he would tell what he would charge if he went for one of us. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't bend at all for his rates, yeah. right? Because he believed, you know, if you can't pay that, then they don't come to me. Yeah. Um, is that it's a lot of his students, you know, have come, he brought them to me because they couldn't sell themselves. He would give them all this education about mm, polygon principles, gotcha. but they just couldn't sell. Now we've taken a lot of his dedicated ones and like made them, you know, 150, 180, $200 an hour trainers and more. But it takes that means of like, you know, you got the education, but now you got the worth mixed in as well too. Yeah. 
What do you think? Like, uh, you know, I was just at club industry show a couple of weeks ago and um, I was on a panel for the um, future of personal training. And that was one of the one of the questions or one of the topics that I had thrown into the panel was about, um, you know, what do trainers need to do to equip themselves for the future? And how do you like from like a macro perspective, how do you feel like we can educate trainers to be like in sales and marketing because there, there's no material. I think I told you and I hate uh, like blasting the ISSA because I really love their certs. Um, they're like their, their fitness material is great. But in the CPT course, it said the best marketing source was the yellow books, <laughs> yellow pages, like the phone book. Oh, crazy. I mean, I, that, ha that literally couldn't have been updated in 15 years. Oh, easily. And that's so on a macro level, the biggest of trainers is – um, you can never like you're putting the, the time into focusing on learning about the health and fitness of the body, the biomechanics, nutrition, those kind of things. You know, I, I know it sounds cliche, but they're going to have to get themselves some sort of coaching or mentorship or be part of somebody, whether it's anybody, whoever it is, be on the cutting edge of their marketing and sales. Like number one is don't ever forget that online is online. Offline is also very important. In fact, you should be mixing the two together. Don't ever just focus your marketing on just social media. Please don't do that. Sure. And I see trainers, like, for example, we, at the Mastermind, you know, like a couple of them only have two sources of uh, lead generation from social media. If that shuts down one day, no, it's probably not going to, but if it ever blocked you, I was talking to Well, Pedro's, you're just going to have to spend a lot of money. 100%. To do it. <laughs> 100%. But then there's also people who are on Instagram who are but more, more on LinkedIn, or but even if you had a direct mailing process in there, or you were doing speaking engagements as well, and you diversify the marketing approach you will never have a problem succeeding yeah. as long as you diversify the process. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, super good advice. Um, so one, uh, from the previous podcast I recorded with Natalia Mello, we were talking about, I actually pitched her the question because her and I, um, have talked about, uh, business coaches before, like mm -hmm. we'll get each other's, uh, insight on that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she was, she was critical of the business coaching, especially in the fitness industry. So as a business coach in the fitness industry, like what is your take kind of on the, what's the coaching scene like right now? That's a great question because I sense that this is why I niched down to what I niched into Yeah, is I began as a business coach and I was like, I, I'm not qualified to be in the industry business as a business coach. This is, this is for me. I'm qualified because I've spent mm -hmm. almost 10 years in personal training and fitness over here. This is where I, I need to be niching. That's where I know the best. Oh, so you started coaching on any kind of business. Yeah. In the very yeah. beginning, I was like, no, no, that's not for me, man. Like I was coaching CEOs of companies and oil companies and I was like, getting results, but I'm like, I wasn't passionate about it. I didn't, sure. I didn't know the niche. I'm like, I'm not qualified for that. Yeah. And you I was hadn't, being, hadn't sat in that seat, no. like in an intimate way. Of course not. Yeah. It's not for me. It's so for somebody else to take that role. Yeah. So I think that, you know, with fitness coaches in general is many don't actually, haven't actually been in the shoes of being an online coach or a personal trainer or owned a partially of a gym. <clears throat> and that's a big problem because sure. if you are in the trenches, you don't know the system. How can you be an expert? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, so the advice, like where we kind of ended up trying to provide some advice in the, in the podcast was that, you know, coaching is great, yeah. but just be very, you know, very critical. Like, do you have any recommendations for kind of vetting out mm. a good coach? Great question. Vetting out a good coach. That is a good question. I would say, um, you know, asking them for some of their client testimonials mm -hmm. or clients they've worked with, what their industry experience actually is. Uh, if they've actually been doing what they've been doing in the backfield before yeah. for a period of time. Have you and done how long? this before? 100%. Yeah. And looking at that and, and looking where their information actually is online coming from. Mm -hmm. Is it just their Instagram page or is it coming from other sources as well? Because Instagram page can, can be a whole big lie at the end of the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. No, I think that was one of the more powerful things that, um, you know, you did during Dis Discovery Day was to have your clients there and say, hey, I was coached to go from here to here. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's powerful stuff. Well, it's funny because that program I told you about, the two-year diploma program, Nate, I actually, um, I remember I told you in the discovery day how their business course was terrible. It was embarrassing, actually. It's this was when you were in... Uh, Nate. That's two, the... the two-year diploma the, program. Like the college, personal yep. training college in Canada, basically. Exactly. Yeah. It's a full-time course, two years. You go, you, you have to do, just like you go full-time for a kinesiology degree. Mm -hmm. And their business course in the last semester was a complete embarrassment. Yeah. You know, and actually I just approached Nate about it because I was like, guys, you know, you are killing your trainers right now and having them invest all this money in education, making them super smart, but they can't make any money. This is yeah. embarrassing. 
that's kind of what I was getting at. Like when I was asking about what would you do from a macro level? Is it like, would someone like you be able to design courses, mm -hmm. you know, that, that work into the certification process? Cause like, obviously, um, it's not like, I don't really feel like it's getting addressed. Like all, most of the business advice you have to get secondhand and hunt out yourself. Whereas it should be a little more built into the process of becoming a trainer. 100%. And that's right now what I'm doing, talking with it about right now, actually, yeah. is is they're actually having me come in and do some workshops with all the students. Okay. Because I've actually had a relationship with them before. Uh, but it's funny because it's still institutions, so they still have their rules, you know, like about regulations and all this. I'm like, that's fine. I, I have no problem to prove the process, you know. But at the same time, it's like, I think of the, tra the trainers in that, in that room that are paying them $10,000 and are leaving with loans to pay and bills to pay. I'm thinking of them more than the school. Yeah, of Because I, I was that kid, you sure. know, that person. I don't want them to go and be hung out dry because my cousin went, um, uh, my cousin on the farm did that program because he thought if I just did what Matt did. Oh, yeah. And then he went there the first year and he totally flopped. He hated it. And he went back and lost five grand, you know, and, uh, and it wasn't over for him, which is fine. But I asked their numbers. I'm like, so all the ones that graduate from this program, how many of them actually, you know, keep going with the program? 25%. That's terrible. Yeah. You know, so the numbers got to change. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's it's a deep passion for me. Like, you can yeah. tell, like, I don't want trainers to be running, running ragged, paying out of their debit cards for or their credit cards for the rest of their life. You know, it upsets me a little bit. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, last question. And this is totally off the cuff because I think um, uh, we have a little extra time here. Um, so... How are you, how do you feel about like one of the questions that we got pitched that was kind of controversial answers, um, on this personal training panel I was on was about the integration of, um, like the medical practice into personal training. Are, mm -hmm. are you seeing any of that? Are you working on that at all? Not really. No, yeah. no, I'm not really working looking at that right now, but I, I'd love to hear what you want to say about that. I love no, you. Well, I, I kind of took a bright side approach because, you know, um, at club industry show, they dedicated a whole track. Um, to incorporating, you know, the medical field and fitness. Okay. You know, kind of saying that, you know, I, as as we know, fitness is great preventative medicine. Yep. You know, and so that we can solve a lot of these um, preventable diseases and stuff that are we are solving now with drugs. Totally. So I was like, of course, the naive optimist that's like, it's going to be great. Yeah, totally. It's happening. Yeah. Look, club industry show is doing it right. 100%. And then um, Michelle Blakely was actually on the panel with me, <laughs> sitting next to me. Um, I'll have her on the show as well, but, um, she was like, uh, I hate to, you know, be the negative Nancy, but, um, until this aligns more with where the money is, I don't see it happening. Like, you know, because there's so much, uh, you know, political pull with, with big pharmacy and, and all of that. So true. I can totally see it happening for sure. Yeah. And that's why I'm wondering on the business side too, like, it's like, uh, even these, these universities want to see all this proof and it comes down to money and it comes to all these other things too. Right. Mm. Oh, that's what you're talking about, what you're kind of alluding to. On the to. business side. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Because it's almost like institutions, they're almost like, well, from what I'm seeing up north in Canada anyway, they're almost like, you know, we're ahead, but they're still 10 years behind. They're trying to play catch up, but they got to pass through hoop A, B, C, and D, and F sure. before they can get to, you know, the one they want to go over here. Yeah. And that's five years later. Yeah. Right. Do you work with trainers around the globe? Yeah. What, uh, like, what's the, do you see any hot spots developing or? <laughs> the funny thing is it's always about freaking what currency of a money are you dealing with? Like whenever we're paying the, paying the invoices, yeah, right. I'm yeah. like, I had a guy with the UK and Australia and I'm like, so what's your currency again? <laughs> yeah. You got to convert it all for them. Oh yeah. It's, it's a, yeah. Luckily I have somebody do that for you, but yeah, it's the funny part. Um, so you're around like the different things. Like, or like, uh, is there one part of like one country or one place where you feel like people are where personal training is like more well received, like some places I can imagine it's like, you know, people don't really see the value or it's less, they're less open-minded about Australia, it. Australia, it's huge, man. That's what I've, Australia. I know that everybody goes there for the seminars and like everyone's killing the seminar game oh, there. Yeah. It's huge down there, dude. Like the education down there is probably one of the, one of the best in the world Yeah. in Australia. Like uh, I have some down there, I have some in the UK, I have some over in like uh, Finland, Newfoundland, not Newfoundland, sorry, Finland, Ice, not Iceland. I can't think of all those names over there, but sure, yeah, whatever. All the Nordic it is. countries. Yeah. Nordic countries, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, cool. Um, so I'll let you kind of tell us a little bit about the services you offer mm -hmm. um, and where people can find out more about those. Perfect. So all we do basically is we just help trainers go from where they are now, you know, to earn ten thousand dollars a month. 
Um, once they get there, they can go take the TRM 10, TRM 20, TRM 30K program. TRM stands for? Uh, trainer Revenue Multiplier. Yeah, TRM. And it's meant to really help trainers go from struggling to insanely profitable in helping them you know, systemize their business, charge their worth, and increase revenue. And the at least the 10K program, that's a 12-week program? Correct. Understood? Yeah. yeah. TRM 20 is eight weeks, and TRM 30 is eight weeks as well. Okay. Yeah, awesome. you got it. And we also do like... Um, Masterminds every quarter for two days. It's more of like an, an immersion to your business to go over optimization and advanced sales and marketing. And what uh, what does a trainer do over those twelve weeks? Um, like, are they how do you, how do you coach them through the process? It's it's a live intimate group coaching session with also some personal coaching as well. We basically we dive, dive into the three things like systemizing their businesses, um, getting also the, the charge you're worth is also a mental process. So we go through some, the mental training as well to how to get yourself to you know, sell at that capacity and also increase and feel you're worthier on that capacity. And then also, how do you increase leads or increase revenue or, or optimize revenue in your business model? Cool. All right. Yeah. And where, where can we find out more about that? Like if someone's interested? Matthewpark.com, one T. Cool. Not and two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Matthew with one T. Yeah, one T. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been writing it wrong. I call uh, That's all That's what I figured, man. <laughs> <laughs> what about social media? Where do we find you on social media? Uh, mindset. Um, mine's underscore Matt with two T's. That's yeah. even confusing for us to yeah. talk about that, man. That's crazy, eh? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> eh? <laughs> awesome, Matt. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, we'll put the link um, to your website in the show notes as well. Awesome. Uh, so people can go check that out there. I got to ask you though, am sure. I the first Canadian on the show or what? Yeah, you are. Oh, this is this is like this is like a, a, a keeper episode. Yeah. You know, one of your uh, special tracks. Groundbreaking. You know? Groundbreaking. I have groundbreaking. actually uh, two Canadian guests that I've talked to um that will be on here but haven't been uh, jonathan goodman's gonna be on here oh, nice awesome yeah, uh, in a couple weeks he's coming to the rise event that's yep. here um and we met in chicago a couple weeks back and then um mark anthony is one of my really good friends oh, nice yeah. that's awesome so cool. well i'm sure that'll be an entertaining episode have you had todd here yet todd no we okay. haven't yeah todd's on the list too so yeah there's three he's that like, are already like, lined up he's like a half breed though <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's pretty texified yeah he's texified yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Matthew, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it, buddy. Yep. Much appreciated.